good to be in the house of the Lord today, is it not? In the book Last Day Events, Mrs. White says, thousands in the 11th hour will see and acknowledge the truth. These conversions to the truth will be made with a rapidity that will surprise the church and God's name alone will be glorified. How many of you are looking forward to a day when thousands will be converted in a day? Are you looking for that day? Yeah. What will they be converted to? They will be converted to Jesus Christ, right? But the reason that they will be converted is from the hearing of the three angels' message. And when we think of the three angels' message, what do we think of? We think of the seal of God. We think of the 2300-day prophecy. We think of the fall Lucifer from heaven. We think of many things. I don't know how many of you were excited when you heard that thousands would be converted in a day. But if thousands would be converted in a day, it means that you and I better know how to preach the three angels' message in a day. Does that make sense? Yeah? How many of you have a favorite movie? And if I asked you to explain that favorite movie to me in 15 minutes or less, you think you can do that? Yeah, you probably could. It's saying that movie was over 15, 20, maybe 50, maybe 100 years. You could probably still explain that movie to me, right? Now, how many of you could explain to me the great controversy in 15 minutes or less? That's a little bit more difficult, isn't it? Ah. Sometimes you just have to be plugged in to the right source. Amen? Let's see if the slides work now. I need your minds to be the screen for the movie today. Let's begin. In Ezekiel 28, it begins with the story of an angel by the name of Lucifer. And Lucifer is described as a covering cherub. Now, to understand what a covering cherub is, we have to go back to the book of Exodus. Exodus 25, God tells Moses to build the sanctuary, right? And inside the sanctuary, the most holy place, which was a reflection of God's throne room up in heaven, was a, a play, something called the Ark of the Covenant. And on top of that ark is the mercy seat, which represents God's throne. Now, in heaven, the foundations of God's throne is his law, right? What was, and the law was what was in the Ark of the Covenant. Does that make sense? Yeah. Are you with me so far in the movie? Now, the Bible says on either side of the Ark were two covering cherubs. And covering, these covering cherubs, these covering angels means that they were called to, to pr protect and defend. Lucifer's first job description in heaven was to protect and defend the law of God. He was to protect, he was guard, called to guard the sanctity of the law because it was a foundation of God's government. But the Bible tells us in Ezekiel 28 that Lucifer was perfect until iniquity was found in him. Now, help me out here. According to the Bible, iniquity is sin, right? And sin is the transgression of the law. So Lucifer, who was supposed to be guarding the law, ends up turning against the law of God. The first war ever broke out over the law of God. I just connected the slides, so if we tried the slides again, they might actually work. Now, the Bible tells us that Lucifer, perfect. Now, the Lucifer t deceives one-third of the angels, and we ask, need to ask ourselves, how does Lucifer deceive a third of the angels? D does Lucifer go around, Psst, hey, psst, you want to be deceptive? You want to be evil? No, right? I Isaiah 14 tells us that Lucifer says, but that I would be like the most high God. Notice what the Bible is saying here. To be as high like the Most High God means to be as righteous as He is. To be as holy as He is. But get what Lucifer is saying. 
Lucifer is saying here that I can be holy like God without some law telling me how to do it. Have you heard that argument before? Oh, well, we don't need God's law to be like God. It's the argument of self-righteousness. And you see, in our culture today, Lucifer's, Lucifer's argument still comes up. Oh, there's other ways to heaven. You Christians have one way. Buddhists have one way. Humanists have one way. But Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. My brothers and sisters, that's not politically correct. You're not going to gain popularity or brownie points with understanding this. But salvation comes through no other name but Jesus Christ. And Lucifer, who was supposed to be guarding the law of God, turning against it. And the Bible says, I would not have known sin except by the law, right? And so the law helps me to identify sin. And if we identify sin, we need, hey, we need somebody to help us out. We need a Savior, right? And if I need a Savior, I need Christ which I mean, need to learn about Christ through his church and through studying his word. And that is what deceived a third of the angels from heaven. Lucifer just said, you know what, there's just other ways of righteousness other than obeying God's law. And that is how the rebellion began. Are you with me in the movie so far? The Bible says that Lucifer and his angels were cast out. And we have to ask ourselves, why wasn't Lucifer immediately judged? Have you ever asked yourself the question? It's a simple question, but it's also very profound. Whenever, a, in the book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 19, uh, Moses lays out a lesson here, that, that when there is conflict between two parties, there must be a neutral third party to discern between the two. When Lucifer's angels rebelled, how many parties were there in heaven? Two. Lucifer and his angels, God and his angels. And for God to sit over judgment at that time would have seemed to be unfair. It's kind of like you taking me to court and then you find out that I'm the judge. Well, <laughs> good for me, bad for you, right? And so for God to sit over judgment would have seemed unfair at the time. So the book of Ezekiel God is speaking of casting out Lucifer and saying, I will lay you before kings. This term is synonymous with some kind of judgment here. And you could see Lucifer saying, come on, don't you know all of heaven is polarized between two points? Who are going to be the ju- who's going to judge me, God? Who will be the jury? Who will be the neutral third party? You are looking at him right now. This is jury selection you don't want to miss out on. 1 Corinthians 6 says, Know ye not that we shall judge angels? We are the kings that God created partly to serve as jurors. So what are these jury requirements? They must have little to no hand, no first-hand experience. Where was humanity when Adam and Eve were created? Weren't even created yet, right? And so, so far so good. They must be law-abiding citizens. Adam and Eve, and Eve were created with the law of God within their hearts. So far, so good. They must be not swayed by public opinion, but must be able to discern right from wrong. So Lucifer sees the creation of man and says, are these the ones that will judge me? Come on, what shall I do? If you had access to the jury in your hands, what would you do? Seek to twist or bribe the jury to your favor, weren't you? And that's exactly what Satan did. He came to the Garden of Eden, and he says, you can be like God. Does that argument sound familiar? Are you with me in the movie so far? And so Adam and Eve were disqualified from jury selection. Jesus comes to, to the Garden to give them a promise. And we know that we, the gospel was given to restore mankind to be sound jurors who know the difference between right and wrong and who are law-abiding citizens. Fast forward to the movie a little bit. And in the book of Exodus, God's got calling his people out of captivity. When Lucifer rebelled in heaven, 
He didn't like God's way. He didn't like how God played the game. And Psalm 77, 13, it says, Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. So Lucifer rebelled against God's sanctuary in heaven. He was really rebelling against God's way. When God calls his children out of Israel to save the entire world, he gives them something special. I call it the blueprint or the GPS, the gospel plan of salvation. Thy way, O Lord, is in the sanctuary. And what happens? If you have to use a GPS, it, if, when you have to use a map, it must mean you're, well, I'll never admit it. So let's keep on going, right? I'll never admit I'm lost. No, I ask for directions all the time. But So God looks down on the children of Israel and it says, I'm going to give you a special gift. And in that gift is the way. I want you to take this way, this GPS in this whole world. So you must understand how Satan must have felt when he saw the replica of what was in heaven, now down here on this earth. Would this draw all men to salvation? We must destroy it, and we must destroy the people who possess it. So how is this the blueprint? Many students know what a mnemonic is, right? It's a device to help you remember something that you're trying to memorize, right? How many of you have used a mnemonic before? Maybe in school, maybe in something else. Let me, let me go over worker safety with you for a moment, right? Um, if you see a fire, but, but, but as a little detour, you know where the closest fire extinguisher is to you right now? If there was a fire here, do you know where a closest fire extinguisher? Look around, look around, my brothers and sisters. We're called to be people of light, a people of safety. If there's a fire extinguisher right there. And in the event of emergency, our exits are... Okay, sorry. <laughs> but worker safety, you, you've, you're familiar with pass, right? And so if you see a fire, you pull it, you pull the pin, you aim it at the base of the fire, you squeeze, and you sweep back and forth. Simple as that, right? It's an acronym. It's a mnemonic that helps us remember something to do when we see a fire. And you know what? Today we're going to paint broad strokes on our canvas. Because each of, the, each of the topics we're going to discuss today, we could spend the entire day talking about them. And that's what Evangelistic Series is for. Come out. You don't want to miss John Bradshaw and Jose Rojas in just a couple months, man. That's going to be such a blessing. Bring your friends. Bring your, fr bring your families. Bring only people you want to see in the kingdom. Bring your enemies. Okay? And so we look at a bird's eye view of the sanctuary. The first piece of furniture is the altar of sacrifice. Right? Do you see that in there? And then it's the laver. And the altar of sacrifice is where the animals were sacrificed. That, that makes sense, right? And so if I sinned or anybody in my family sinned, I would take an innocent, perfect lamb. I would confess my sins over that lamb. I would then take a knife. This is not G-rated, folks. And slit that lamb's throat. That sacrifice of the lamb represented what Christ would do on Calvary. I don't think we realize if you had to take your favorite animal, let's say your cat, your dog, something you've become attached to and you had to slice that little innocent animal's throat, would we think twice about arguing with our parents? Would we think twice about committing sin? That's what Christ did for you and for me. He took the sacrifice. And then there comes the labor. And the priest would wash their hands and their feet. And that purification process, as Christians we know, is baptism, right? That new life experience, dying to our old self. You go inside the sanctuary, the holy place, the most holy place, and what do you find? You find three items. You find the candlestick, you find the incense, and you find the table of showbread. You go to the table of showbread. That represents God's word. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Then you have the altar of incense. The high priest would burn incense every morning and when he tended the lamps and every evening when he lit them. To be a permanent incense ascending to the Lord represents our prayers. 
The New Testament says pray without ceasing and the, the smoke of the incense would have a sweet smelling aroma. Do you know your prayers are sweet smelling aromas to the Lord? Amen. It's exciting. We should be praying without ceasing. We need to be praying to God constantly because it's a sweet perfume toward the Lord. Amen. Amen. Then you come to the candlesticks. And that represents the Holy Spirit, but it represents our witness through the Holy Spirit. Ye are the light of the world. The city on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do men light their candle and hide under a bush. It's your witness, my friends. And so the most holy place, you have the Ark of the Covenant. This is the blueprint. This, is that, this sanctuary is the gospel plan of salvation. Are you with me in the movie so far? Are you tracking? Yeah? So God delivers his people through this plan over and over and over again. How is it? When God's people was in Egypt. And the, the night before they were to leave, God told them to put blood on the doorpost. Right? That's the labor. And to protect them, why? Because the angel of death was coming through. And so what happened? Finally, Pharaoh was like, hey, get out of here. I don't want to see you guys again, man. And so, so the children of Israel leave, and they go through the Red Sea, and what happens? Pharaoh has buyer's remorse and said, hey, go get them. That was the last end of Pharaoh's army. Why? Because th they went through, got about halfway through the Red Sea, but were destroyed in the Red Sea, right? That's a labor. And... Finally, what happens? They started to complain. I'm hungry. Give us something to eat, Moses. God gives him manna. That's a table of showbread. Israel, you're, you're my peculiar treasure, my light of the world. I'm going to use all, you to bring salvation to all men. What is that? That's a seven-branch candlestick. And then God says, I'm gonna, I want you to spend three days in hard preparation. Why? Because Exodus 20, God is coming down, speaking the Ten Commandments. Are, are you tracking with me in the movie? So you go from Exodus 12 to Exodus 14, Exodus 19, Exodus 19, all the way to Exodus 20. Boom, boom, boom. We just went through the book of Exodus right there. Or let's do a few more. Jesus was born in a manger among animals. We could say that he was born on the altar of sacrifice. He was baptized at age 30. That's a labor. He was led into the wilderness and turn these stones into bread. Then, what was the second temptation? Turn, uh, offer up a presumptuous prayer to save yourself. And then, I know you came for your people, your seven-branch candlestick. Just bow down to worship me, and that's the easy way out. That's... Christ overcame all three temptations, and he came, went to talk about the law combined with the mercy of God. Or we could reverse it, that Christ came down from his throne up in heaven. He lived a life of Bible study, prayer, and let his light shine. He was baptized and then crucified. Or how about Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John talk about the sacrifice of Christ. The book of Acts talks about baptism. The book of Romans through Jude talks about the importance of prayer, Bible study, and witnessing. And the book of Revelation brings us up to the throne room of heaven. Beloved, we ought to know this blueprint. This is the plan of salvation. This is what the world doesn't understand. So if I want to be saved, I must first accept Christ. And if I first accept Christ, then I'm going to be baptized. And then I'm going to spend time studying his word, spending time in prayer, spending time witnessing. And when I'm doing that, ultimately, I'm leading people into the throne room of God. Get the idea that the devil is angry at this plan. And the entire Old Testament is about the devil trying to destroy the blueprint and destroy the people who possess the blueprint. Are you with me in the movie so far? Imagine for a moment that the blueprint is a football. And he gives it to Israel and he says, Israel, take it down the field. And Israel starts, take, starts to run with the ball. But they begin to rebel. They get stubborn. And they fall into Babylonian captivity. What happens now? We're introduced to three time prophecies in the book of Daniel. Are you with me in the movie so far? 
And so the first time prophecy is the 70-week prophecy. And it simply says that God is saying to Israel, Israel, the one who the sanctuary is pointing to will come in 70 weeks. If you are not ready, I'm going to give this blueprint to someone else. Guess what? Jesus comes. Israel rejects him. And Jesus dies. The veil of the temple is ripped from top to bottom. And after his resurrection, he ascends into heaven. And the blueprint for this blueprint is given from literal Israel and given to spiritual Israel. Guess what? We've gone through the entire Old Testament today. God gives the gift of tongues so he can take the message of the heavenly sanctuary and the heavenly high priest into all the world. That's Hebrews. And off spiritual Israel goes down the field and nothing can stop him. And Satan is saying here, I have to stop him. I have to stop him. What is, what is Satan to do? And so he raises up literal Israel to attack spiritual Israel. And then he raises up literal Rome to attack spiritual Israel. But every time a Christian dies, it just multiplies and multiplies and multiplies his work. So Satan is saying, you know what? I have to change my strategy. And now we're introduced to the second of the three time prophecies in the book of Daniel. The 1260 years. And this prophecy is sta- simply stated that there will arise a little horn power. And this little horn power will seek to cast down God's blueprint. Are you with me in the movie so far? Are you at the edge of your seats? Is this exciting stuff? Yeah. Wow. So the question is, how does God use this little horn power to counterfeit? Because Satan never does anything original. It's always a counterfeit for God's ideal plan. So how is this casting down God's original plan, the blueprint in the sanctuary? So what happened during the 1260 years, during the Dark Ages? The church of the Dark Ages cast down every single important aspect of the sanctuary. How is that, you say? The altar of burnt offerings, which represents Christ's sacrifice, was cast down and replaced with a teaching called penance. Christ's sacrifice alone was not good enough for your sins. You have to pay a certain amount of money for, to the church for your sins to be forgiven. The altar of sacrifice, which represents Christ and represents his one-time sacrifice, was now replaced with something called the Eucharist, which means the literal body of Christ was broken each time was, communion was partaken of. How about the labor, which represents baptism? The church in the Dark Ages said that we're going to substitute God's plan with something called infant sprinkling in the place of genuine baptism, which calls for repentance and conversion. Not only did they did that, but they went to the holy place and the table of showbread, which represents God's word. And they said, man cannot understand God's word by yourself. You need a priest to explain it to you. And so the traditions of the church is more important than the word of God. Not only did that, did that but they replaced the altar of incense and say, you can't pray to God directly. You have to go through a priest. And notice this, my brothers and sisters, they even created a two-part chamber, just like the holy place and the most holy place, with a man sitting in the place of God hearing the confessions of other men. Is that not symbolism for the holy and most holy place right there? Wow. They put out the light of the church. They said, hey, you can't witness, you can't show your faith. Thus creating the dark ages. The Ark of the Covenant, which talks about the mercy seat and the judgment of God, we'll replace that with a thing called purgatory. Someone has to pay and suffer to get to heaven. There's no such thing as a judgment. They went up to the most holy place and took the law and they changed the law and they took the seventh-day Sabbath and threw that out and instead placed it, replaced it with Sunday, the first day for worship. So what is God going to do now? Can you see in the movie? It seems like all the sanctuary, all God's way is lost. What is God going to do now? But there's one more time prophecy. And this prophecy stated that the end of the 2300-year prophecy, at that time the sanctuary shall be cleansed. 
And some Bibles say that the sanctuary will be restored. So let's watch. Over 500 years, how God restores every truth that was put down during the Dark Ages. There was a man by the name of John Wycliffe. He comes onto the scene in the 1300s. John Wycliffe, what he does is he translates the Bible in the common language, thus restoring the, the table of showbread. Even right now, you have Wycliffe Bible translators that are active today, translating the Word of God in different languages. Do you know today there are 6,000 people groups that have yet to hear the Word of God? Man, we need to be active in sharing our faith around the world. And so in 1300s, he, Wycliffe pretty much restored the table of showbread. It, you know what? If I live in 1300s, you better believe I would be following this guy all around, man. Because, man, this is good stuff, man. The Word of God, you can read in your own language? I don't think we realize the significance of that. Because we have it in our phones, we have two dozen copies at home, we have it on the internet. But imagine, you can't read the Bible in your own language. The only thing you knew about God was through stories and by going to church. You don't realize the significance of what John Wycliffe did to revolutionize the, our Christian walk. And so in 1300s, you better believe, I'd be following this guy all around. In the 1400s, a man by the name of, John, of Martin Luther comes on the scene. And what Martin Luther does in the 1500s is restore the truth about the sacrifice of Christ. And that the sacrifice of Christ for peace for our sins, it's not penance. Are you with me in the movie so far? And so if I live in the 1500s, the four, and late 1400s, you better believe, I'd be following Martin Luther around. Praise the Lord for the Lutheran movement. The just shall live by faith. Amen. In the 1500s, a man by the name of John Calvin comes on the scene. And John Calvin is the founder of the Presbyterian movement. And he has a special burden about prayer. He says you can go at this radical idea that you can go directly to the throne room of God. You don't need an intermediary like the priest. Man, those are fine words for them back then in the 1500s. You better believe. And so he restores the altar of incense. You better believe that in this time, I'd be following this guy all around. I would be a Presbyterian. Amen? Can you see how the ball is being passed from one movement to another to another? That truth is ever progressing. That's why we call it progressive revelation. Don't be content with what you learned about God 30 years ago. God has something new and fresh for you today. Your walk with God should be ever continuing and growing and learning. In the 1600s, a man by the name of John Smith comes on the scene. And through Bible study, he realized that, you know what? You've got to be fully immersed to be baptized. You can't do any of this infant sprinkling. And that's to be baptized, you need to um, confess and repent from your sins. John Smith, in the 1600s, started the Baptist movement. You better believe it, that if I was in the 1600s, I would be a Baptist. Praise the Lord for the Baptist movement. In the 1700s, a man by the name of John Wesley comes on the scene. And he is part of the Methodist movement. And he has a special burden to get the gospel out to the entire world. Thus effectively restoring the seven branch candlestick. Stick. So let your light shine. Now in the 1700s, you better believe it. I would be following John Wesley all around. Hey, wait a second, I'm still doing that, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord for the Methodist movement. And what is the last piece of furniture to be restored? What movement would God call up in the 1800s, my brothers and sisters? To restore the missing piece of furniture. William Miller, in the 1800s, comes to restore the last piece of furniture, the Ark of the Covenant, which is all about what? About the judgment. About restoring the Ten Commandments. 
This is a unique message, my brothers and sisters. You are not part of another movement. God has called you for such a time as this. That is why the first angel's message goes out to all the world. For this gospel could not have been preached in the Dark Ages because this had not been restored. But by 1844, everything had been restored. Listen to me. All Seventh-day Adventists are, or Baptists, Lutherans, Methodists, Presbyterians. We just kept the truth and we kept it going. Do you see that? I shared this experience before, but I was in an elderly lady's home a couple of years ago as a Bible worker. And she was wondering why in a small town of 500 people that there were two Lutheran churches. I love how God sets these things up because just a couple hours before, I was talking with my neighbor who was a Lutheran minister, and I asked him the same question. And so she, I explained to her the difference between Missouri Synod and Norwegian Lutheran. And you could have seen the look on her face when she's like, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I had to politely say, well, you may not believe it, but this is what your church believes. Unfortunately, there are many people today that go to church, but they really don't know what their church believes. Are you that person? Are, are, have you been going to an Adventist church, and yet you're not quite sure what the Seventh-day Adventists believe? Talk to myself. Talk with Pastor Wesley or Pastor Kim. We'll be happy to sit down and start explaining the precious truth that we have. In 1982, there was a football game, Cal State versus Stanford, and it was merely called The Play. Four seconds left on the clock. You can look it up on Wikipedia. Cal State was down by one point. The band had already begun to celebrate. All Stanford had to do was to kick the ball off, and they figured, hey, we got this, man. The game is over. Four seconds. What's the other team going to do in four seconds, my friends? What are the odds? So they kick off the ball, and down the field they ran. Cal State gets the ball, and they begin running. And the first guy's running, but just as someone tackles in, he passes the ball off. The second guy is running. And by this time, the other band is on the field. They think, hey, man, let's celebrate. Yeah, we've won this game. But the second guy is running. The commentator is raising his voice because the second tie, the second guy, he, he gets tackled and he falls. But just as he falls, he passes the ball off. The people are on their feet screaming. The second guy gets tackled, but he passes the ball off. The third guy, the fourth guy, the fifth guy, the sixth guy, he runs in the end zone. The game is over. Listen to me. The devil's band is on the field. They think you as Adventists are beaten people. All I'm saying is get up and finish the game. I can see the angels cheering for us like we would be on the game, and they're saying, take it to the end zone. Take it to the end time. There's no time left. 1844 was the last time prophecy. They're cheering for us. And God's people goes down the field. The first angel's message, the second angel's message, the third angel's message. And the third angel, three angels' message sums up with this. It's no more than the message of Noah. Get in to the ark. Get into the ark before it's too late because the seal of God, the Sabbath, is found in the ark. Because if you are not in the ark, you are marked for death. The angels with the seven last plagues are seen coming out of the most holy place. Why? Because those who receive the place or those who have rejected what was found in the most holy place. Our message is simple. Get into the ark. Psalms 91 says, He who dwells in the secret place of the most high shall abide in the shadow of the mighty. You jump down to verse 10, says, No plague shall destroy you. Jesus comes, he cracks the sky. The dead are raised and go to heaven for jury duty. When the books were opened in 1840, Satan accusing God's people. And the reason that the books were opened is not to condemn you, but to prove Satan is a liar. Well, when Satan says, well, he did this, and Jonathan did this, God says, well, my book says they repented. You see, the books contain key evidence to save you, not to destroy you. Do you see how, God tw or how Satan twists that to make judgment something we're fearful of? So the angels say, Justin, true are your ways, you judge righteously. 
And now the judgment begins at the millennium. They too get to see the books and they join the chorus and say, Justin, true are your ways, O God. And now we get to the end of millennium where God comes down and resurrects the wicked dead. The wicked dead are resurrected. The world turns into this giant movie theater that the world has ever seen. We are told in panoramic view, each will re- everyone will watch the movie, Earth's final movie. Ellen White says that each actor will recall his role. I want you to see this is reality, D, re- reality TV. This is not make-believe. I don't want to be come to a point. And my neighbors and friends said, you saw this movie and you didn't tell me? You told me about the Lego movie. You told me about Frozen. You told me about The Hobbit, but you didn't tell me about the movie that could have saved my life? And now comes a time that God must destroy the wicked. I will be brief because time is running out. Time is running out. Understand this one thing, that God must destroy the wicked, but the reason that God uses fire is not because he's mad, but because he is love. You see, God is described as a consuming fire, but Song of Solomon tells us that fire is a consuming love. Have you ever been in love before? Husbands, you better raise your hands. You've experienced that fire, you know what it's like. And that is what God's like. He is fire. His city is a city of fire. His throne is a throne of fire. And he wants us to be able to dwell in the fire and not be consumed. If you want to be in the presence of God, you have to be fireproof. And so God, just like he showed Moses the burning bush, and Moses said, how is it that this bush burns and yet not is consumed? God was trying to show Moses his ideal for his people. He wants people to be able to stand in his presence. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown in that fire and were not consumed. It's the righteous that burn forever. The wicked are not fireproof, so they burn up. God will not allow the wicked to be in heaven because heaven would be hell for them. See how the devil flips that again? So God, with his great big arm, stretches out and embraces the wicked one last time. And in that embrace, they, the wicked feel the love they rejected, and they say, Justin, true are your ways. There's a unanimous decision to destroy the wicked. God rebuilds the earth, and it says, from Sabbath to Sabbath, we will worship God. And do you want to know why? Because just as Israel was commanded to keep the Sabbath as commemoration from delivery from captivity, so we will ever keep the Sabbath as a reminder of our deliverance from this earth. It's the movie. Please understand that God has called you for such a time as this. You may be sitting on the fence right now. It's like, well, I can't give Bible study. I can't understand. If God's called you to it, he's going to explain it. He's going to work through it. And so, if you've doubted your Adventism, doubt it no longer. God has a Seventh-day Adventist church at the cusp of eternity for a specific time, for a specific message. Do you want to make that commitment today? To go all the way with God? Won't you just stand right now and say, yes, I want to reaffirm my calling as a Seventh-day Adventist. Perhaps you're like, you know what? I've never considered Adventism before, but you know what? I want to look into it more. Talk to myself, talk to Pastor Wesley. But if you'd like to make that commitment and say, you know what? I'm going to go all the way with God. I want you to just stand up right now. Stand up right where you are and say, you know what? I am going all the way with God. I want to commit my life to go all the way. Amen. Shall we just close with prayer? Father in heaven, you have called us for such a time as this. You have a special group of people in these last days. We are your people. Lord, we're asking right now that you will empower us, that you would... um, Fill us with your spirit that we may go out and share you more more boldly with those around us. In your name we pray. Amen.